everyone, welcome back to the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Bobby Sylvester, joined as always by Mike Taglier, and we've got a really cool show planned for today, so we're going to be talking late round flyers for the first 40 minutes, and some of you might not be as excited about this portion, but it needs to happen eventually. DST and kickers, we're going to be talking about who to draft, who to avoid, strategies behind that at the end of the show as well, and we're of course joined by an excellent guest, this time it's Joe Pizapia, author of the number one selling Fantasy Black Book series and host of the Fantasy Black Book pod at Fantrax, he's on Twitter at Joe JoePizapia17, I'm at Bobby Fantasy Pro, and tags is at Mike Taglier NFL. Joe, how's it going man? It's going great, and I realize now why I'm here, because I'm so entertaining, and I'm the only guy that can make defense special teams and kickers really pop and sparkle. That's that's what it is. That's you're you're going to have to do some kind of magic, man, because I have nothing up my sleeve today. That's all right. Challenge accepted. I'm ready to go. I'm just going to call this the punishment because this is this is this is what happens when you lose twice at Family Feud. Can I take the show off? Can I do that? You know, how long are you going to live on this? You're like, you know, this is like the Eagles fans are going to live on Nick Foles forever. It's only been like a couple of weeks. I'm still riding high. Yeah. Well, again, it's not so much me being wrong so much as everyone else being wrong. Don't you understand that? Everyone who gave those bad answers about people screwing up things. We had Celia on actually uh, last week, and uh, I was up on him 200 to nothing, and um, that was fantastic. So <laughs> well, he was saying great. the same thing. He was a... Uh, Which is just so funny because Celia's the most competitive guy. Like, you know it ruined his whole year. Jake and I were on air at FNTSY for two and a half years together, and every day we were to the drive time show, Jake and I, and it was... It is. He, we play games all the time on that show, and he gets so mad if he loses or whatever it is. And then every Christmas, we would have the annual Die Hard is not a Christmas movie argument, to which it is, because obviously it is. And I would just make him mad, and that was just fun. It's never seen it. Oh, it's so easy to make him angry, too, which is the best. <laughs> and then we call him Hulk, and then we play the drop of Hulk. <laughs> i wondered for a while if it was like a bit or whatever because like whenever i lose to tags in, in mock drafts obviously it's set up to make the show a lot more exciting otherwise i would just win all the time but i always make oh, it sound like it. i'm really upset when really it's just kind of like i'm just having fun every oh, yeah. every once in a while someone on twitter is like bobby you need to cool it man you're taking this way too seriously like guys you realize my job is to entertain you while giving analysis so um, I don't know. Hey, guys, by the way, if you guys are new to the show, what we're talking about is a, fan- a fantasy feud segment that we do where it's like family feud, but we're doing it with fantasy football and we get answers from that. You can check it out on our YouTube channel at YouTube.com slash fantasy pros. Oh, guys, I feel so good today. Do you know what I got in the mail yesterday? Tags Lou Malnati's pizza, baby. It was delicious. I ate it immediately. Dude, Lou Malinati's has taken care of us. Um, I just want to I just want to give a shout out to them and just say, like, if you're if you're in Chicago, Lou Malnati's is a staple. Oh, even if you're not in Chicago, just order it. They'll send it to you. I don't live in Chicago, and they sent me pizza. It was awesome. I saw the Twitter pic or Instagram, whatever it was you posted. I saw it. I was like, why is Bobby holding a pizza? What is that? <laughs> yeah. No, Kevin Kevin is part of their marketing department. He's really hooked us up the, the last two years now, and I just want to say thank you, and thank you to Lou Malinati's for uh, supplying us with pizza. We definitely appreciate it. Yeah, he's one of my favorite people in the world for sure, and I told them I will get a Lou Malinati's tattoo on my spine, on my butt, on my face, wherever you guys want me to put it. If you guys set up a Lou Malnati's in St. Louis. Wow. That offer stands. I think this needs to happen. Yeah. Can we get a GoFundMe <laughs> or something? Can we start something? <laughs> yeah, we should do that. Yeah. All right, guys. So late round flyers, the way we're going to do this, we're each going to give uh, five of them or, you know, through about 40 minutes of the show. And we're just going to take turns. Joe, you're going to go first. So who's somebody in rounds, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15 that you'd like to add to the end of your roster? Uh, when I'm thinking flyers, I'm thinking maybe upside guys that could potentially be league winners. Who do you like, Joe? Uh, Well, there's one for me that I've been adding a lot of lately because I like what I've seen out of him in preseason. Not that preseason matters too much. And granted, he's played a lot with the twos. That's why he looks good with the twos. However, the track record of Steelers wide receivers historically is very good. And I know they're very high on Washington as a talent. So I've pivoted from Dante Moncrief to more shares of James Washington as drafts have gone on. And that's because right now he looks like he could have that, as you said, Bobby, upside talent. And that's what I want. And historically, there's always room for a second wide receiver in this offense. I know people are high on Vance McDonald this year, and everybody loves James Conner. He's already hurt. Right. <laughs> you know, I love the quote from the OC the other day on him. There's no way he's playing a lot of snaps. It's never going to happen. It was like the funniest. <laughs> like, don't talk to me about Vance McDonald playing football. It was really hilarious, that quote. But I think Washington's one of these guys with upside in a good offense that you know is going to be aggressive, that you know is going to throw the football. And I think that even if it doesn't happen right away, even if it's a little bit of a timeshare or the snap count isn't super high in September, that by the time we turn the page by Halloween, that he is going to be somebody that has the potential to be a stud. You know, Tex, before they signed Dante Moncrief, we were talking about it. James Washington's going to 
to be everyone's favorite sleeper. And here he is in ECR, ECR's expert consensus rankings. You can find that at fantasypros.com slash rankings. So it mashes together like 100 analyst rankings across the industry to tell you what the industry analysts think as a whole. They've got James Washington so much lower than we started him at just a couple months ago. And it was looking like Dante Moncrief was going to start tags, but he got one reception in the preseason game and he fumbled it. Does this concern you at all? Like this one play in the preseason, do you think it impacts the depth chart that much? I don't think we need to like pick one or the other, to be honest with you. Um, but, like the, the Steelers are going to run a lot of three wide receiver sets. Like they don't do a lot of 12 personnel or anything like that. So uh, with Vance McDonald being hurt again, I don't blame the OC for want, not wanting to talk about him because he like the dude's like a straw man. Uh, basically, <laughs> if he could stay on the field for all 16 games, like I think Vance McDonald would be considered like a top eight fantasy tight end. But the people that have paid attention to Vance McDonald's career is that he cannot stay on the field. So therefore, why are we going to commit more snaps with him and build our offense around him if he's not going to be there so I actually am buying those comments in regards to him but again if the Steelers are going to run three wide receiver sets that means Juju's going to go back into the slot which is where he he is best at and then you're going to have James Washington and Dante Moncrief on the field Moncrief is a probably a better red zone threat like we've seen him do it throughout his career whereas James Washington is a guy coming out of college that we really liked is is somebody who could stretch the field he uh, lost a lot of weight this offseason like he I think he dropped like 15 pounds if I'm not mistaken because he was built somewhat like a running back and so what would I hear Ben Roethlisberger and Mike Tomlin talk about James Washington it's never negative they're never like they never talk about him like it's Vance McDonald they talk about him like a kid that is learning the offense that does great in practice but we haven't seen that stuff translate to games I think we saw it last preseason I think there was a game where he had two touchdowns in if I'm not mistaken and then you know you go back to week one of the preseason and you watch him play into the second quarter and he uh he put on a show like James Washington is really good at football Dante Moncrief is now on his third team in three years I think they're both going to see a lot of snaps in this offense. I don't really know if it matters uh, which one is above the other on the depth chart because I, I think they're going to see similar snaps. So I like James Washington as a flyer. It's like, find out what you got. And if he is starting over Moncrief in two wide receiver sets, that's a huge plus in his corner. So I like this one, Joe. I also uh, I found the uh, Randy Feigner uh, quote, by the way, about Vance McDonald, just because it's funny. Uh, when asked if uh, Vance McDonald will see increased playing time in 2019, he said, quote, he won't. He's never going to play the full game. That's never going to happen, period. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> this sounds like something a fantasy owner would say to you after you pick Vance McDonald. I, l- I love when the coaches just hate the media. It's just really interesting <laughs> to me because, like, I know everyone sitting at home, if they were to be interviewed by these guys, would respond that way. But a lot of people are really professional. And I just love it when someone like Baker Mayfield stands up to them and is just like, would you guys stop being jerks and putting words in my mouth? Yeah. You know, I'm looking at ADP right now, and James Washington's going in the 10th round. Dante Moncrief's going two rounds later. And it's the opposite when you're looking at uh, ECR. So the expert consensus rankings have Moncrief a little bit higher than uh, than James Washington. So uh, that's a little bit telling to me. Now, I do like Washington's upside quite a bit more. I think he's a great dart throw. But maybe in some of these less competitive family and friend leagues, People are still drafting James Washington in the 10th round. That surprises me. Yeah, that quote on uh, Vance McDonald sounds like one of your league mates. Like, imagine being at your draft and saying, ah, it's the 10th round. I'm going to go Vance McDonald. And someone goes, like, he's actually going to play 16 games. Like, he's going (laughs) to be on the field. all. That's his OC telling you that, guys. Come on. (laughs) It's true. All right, Tag. So who do you have? And by the way, I think there's going to be uh, probably some repetition in this show. If you've been listening for a while, you know we've been talking about some of the same players quite a bit. I mentioned Justice Hill all the time. Tags talks about Geronimo Allison. Um, I mean, you guys have to understand there's a lot of new listeners with every show and every week. We want to make sure they're not missing out on our best advice, our best information. So I'm sorry if you guys have to hear something two, three, four times. We just want to make sure everyone's getting the players that we think um, will help them win fantasy championships the most. So if there is some repeats, uh, that's why. And also, if you want to check out extra content along these lines, we've got our new YouTube channel. Again, that's youtube.com slash fantasy pros. Tex just came out with his top 10 sleepers video. I came out with five deep sleepers earlier this month. So you can watch those again at youtube.com slash fantasy pros. All right, Tags, it's to you for your uh, late round dart throws. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to say this guy before someone else does, because like I want to be the one to take credit for it. (laughs) Darwin Thompson of of the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, you took my guy. So we've been talking all offseason about getting that handcuff to Damian Williams. You know, we we thought it was Carlos Hyde. And then now we have uh, Darwin Thompson, sixth round pick, a a little bit of smaller guy. Uh, I think he's 5'10", 200 pounds. Like he's not a a very big guy, but Christian McCaffrey, again, wasn't a very big guy. We're looking for the running back that's going to be playing for Andy Reid. That's what we want. And uh, he's reportedly moving past Carlos Hyde on the depth chart. He's looked fantastic in the preseason. He's broken a few tackles. Now, they were pretty weak tackles from what I saw. Uh, But at the same time, he 
is showing the ability to at least break tackles if someone doesn't come proper. And uh, like playing for Andy Reid is something we've seen, you know, Chuck Hendrick West, Spencer Ware, Damian Williams, a guy that was a nobody. He's 27 years old, guys. Running backs don't just break out late in their career. Kareem Hunt, like we've seen everybody that plays for Andy Reid continually succeed, finishes an RB1, RB2 week in, week out. So it's like when you're taking a late round dart throw, it's like take shots on guys like this that have impressed in, in camp and that – there is no for sure starter in Kansas City. Let's not pretend that Damian Williams is a world beater, that he's like a can't miss talent. Because again, 27 years old, this is like he was picked up for free in free agency. Like nobody was bidding against the Chiefs on him. He had six carries before like week 10 of last year. Darwin Thompson is a great late round pick. It's so funny, Tags, because obviously everyone knows Justice Hill is my guy. He's my number one. So I figured no one else would mention him. And I could start with Darwin Thompson because he's flown up my board like big time and uh, you took my thunder there and uh, I just want to tell everybody you can look at Darwin Thompson's ADP it doesn't matter where it is his ADP is going to be catching up over the next few weeks and if you wait to draft him in the 14th 15th round where he's been going you won't get him you've got to take him in the 12th maybe 11th maybe even 10th round I think he will be worth that because uh, besides Daryl Henderson and, and the guys like, you know, Rashad Penny, Royce Freeman, is there a better backup running back who would step into a situation immediately be an RB1? I, I don't think so, Joe. Yeah, it's like Latavius Murray thing. Like, that's the guy that kind of sticks out. And then after that, it's questionable. But uh, this is a guy actually in May. I've been a never Damian Williams guy. <laughs> like Me too. I don't know if there's yeah. a, it's a hashtag for that, but if not, I just made one. So for me, I've never been into that. I, I just, there was something about it and I hated what the cost was when you're looking in May into June and people, you know, the early ADP second round. Oh, I was crazy. And I used to argue, it's funny because Jake was the guy I was arguing about it with. And he and I just flat out knocked down, dragged out arguments. I was like, I understand. I get it. It's the Andy Reid system. I get it. But it's still Damian Williams. And there's still a lot of questions I have. And I'm not ready to put second round value on him. I'm just not there yet. And the whole thing was I thought Darwin Thompson was this guy that had a lot of intrigue. I saw what he did in college and I was very intrigued. And like Tax was saying about, you know, we have Philip Lindsay. We have these guys, these smaller backs who come into the league and they're not just okay. They're not just change of pace. They're like number one running back. So after you see Lindsay, after you see some of these smaller guys recently in the NFL have success, it's become more of a speed game than a power game in a lot of respects nowadays anyway. So I think Thompson's going to be more than that. What what kind of quelled my excitement was the Carlos Hyde you know, being brought in and that kind of made me kind of harumph and get frustrated. But as the preseason goes on, I think there's no doubt. I think Darwin Thompson is by far the better investment than the Damian Williams investment where you have to draft him. I don't think it's even close. Thompson has moved ahead of Hyde on the depth chart. At this point, I think Hyde is probably going to get cut. If you if you own Hyde, I would drop him. There's other guys on your on the free agents that you can pick up. Uh, Chase Edmonds would be one that I would encourage you to take a look at in case anything happens to David Johnson. But yeah, I mean, uh, Damian Williams right now is going ahead of guys like uh, Sonny Michel, Melvin Gordon. I, I can't understand that. No, I don't get it either. And and I just I refuse to buy in. And plus, you know, there's just so much to like about this team. And the, the one thing about the Chiefs is the defense still stinks, which means they're going to continue to be aggressive in the air, too. So I don't even know at this point, as much as you love the Andy Reid running back. Look, let's be honest, too. They're going to be throwing the ball a ton again this year. Yeah. So what would you guys say the over under is for Damian Williams carries? I'd put it at 190. I'd go under. I'd go under. That's that's 12 a game. That's 12 for a full season. And he's never had more than 13 in the regular season. Yeah, I'm going under on the 190 for Williams, for sure. I am too. I think at some point it's either he's going to lose the job or he's going to um, like have to miss time and then he's going to lose the job again. <laughs> <laughs> either way, it ends up losing the job. <laughs> Darwin Thompson's a league winner regardless is what you're saying, Tags. Yeah, and like he has to play the Jaguars in week one, so it's not like a cake matchup or anything for him either. So it's like if Damian Williams starts the season, that, that might not be a bad thing. You know, uh, the Jags aren't very good against pass catching running backs. So I think this, you know, he's actually going to be a little bit sneaky and everyone's going to be coming to us on Twitter at Mike Taglier NFL. If you have anything negative to say um, and saying, <laughs> I can't believe you guys were wrong about Damian Williams. They'll be taking victory laps. So, yeah, you love the week one stuff. You got to love the. It's like the April baseball things. You know, you got to love when that happens. Everybody out of the woodwork about, you know, like Christian Walker is the greatest first baseman ever. OK, talk to me in June. <laughs> we'll talk about it again. All right, guys, I'm going to give my first one here in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you about an opportunity we have with NFL Game Pass. Guys and girls, only with NFL Game Pass are you going to get every out-of-market preseason game live. And with the preseason already underway, your season can start now with NFL Game Pass. You can get your first look at all the rookies and all the players on new teams. It's all the action, all the football you can handle, 
all in one place. You know, I'm most excited to watch Justin Jackson this preseason. I think he's going to end up stealing that job from Austin Eckler if Melvin Gordon doesn't come back. And I love watching this kid play. He's so agile. With NFL Game Pass, I can watch Justin Jackson live in the preseason. And you know what? If I miss the game, I can replay it after it's aired. Whoever you want to watch this preseason, you'll need NFL Game Pass to do so if you're out of market. How's Kyler Murray going to look leading Cliff Kingsbury's offense? Is Jacoby Myers going to end up stealing a Patriots starting job at wide receiver? Does Hunter Henry look healthy after his long absence? Make sure to see all of the action this preseason with NFL Game Pass. And best of all, you can kick off the 2019 NFL season with a seven-day free trial of NFL Game Pass. Sign up now at NFL.com slash Fantasy Pros. All right, I'm going to skip Justice Hill. Someone else can talk about him if they want to. I've talked about him every single episode for the past month. He's my number one must-have guy. I want to talk about Tony Pollard. And I was kind of poo-pooing on the idea that he can be anything more than a three-down back. I called him, you know, another version of Naheem Hines. But the Cowboys don't think of him that way, and that's very clear. Even if they're just trying to convince Ezekiel Elliott to come back and, hey, they've got this three-down back, he's been the only guy on the field with the first team. When Dak Prescott is out there, Tony Pollard is out there. I watch his tape, and he looks impressive. It looks like he can run between the tackles. They just didn't use him that way in college. So I kind of like the idea that he's got these fresh legs going behind. I just ranked my offensive lines, and I'm going to post on Twitter this afternoon. One of the three best offensive lines in football still. I think Tony Pollard has borderline RB1 upside for as long as Zeke holds out, and it could be all season. Who knows? Yeah, I'm still cautiously optimistic that the Ezekiel Elliott will be there. It's a different situation than Gordon. It's a different situation than even Le'Veon Bell last year. So I think what you're saying is it's it's in a certain vacuum where Ezekiel Elliott is not playing. Because once Ezekiel Elliott's there, it's he's there and getting paid now, which is more to the fact that uh, Tony Pollard and anybody else is going to be sitting on the sidelines because you're not going to pay a guy like that and not use him as much as you should. So I think that's that's part of the equation here. But should Ezekiel Elliott sit out for a fair amount of time? I understand where you're coming from. I'm not as, as huge on that just because I do believe Elliott is going to play week one. So simulate a thousand seasons, okay, Joe? On average. <laughs> Wait, in my head? Hold on. In okay. your head. Simulate a thousand <laughs> seasons in your head. How many games on average, including holdout, including injuries, is Zeke missing? Um, I, I, in, a, in a given year, I think one. One. Okay. Um, I mean, based on just injury rates for workhorses, I'd put it closer to three. I understand, but he's a little special. They miss on average two and a half. He's been really durable, but he's a, he's a special. And his problem has not been health on the field, has been mental health off the field. I think that's the problem with him. Um, but he, I mean, even if there's just a 25% chance that you get an RB1 for four weeks, isn't that what we would love to have on our bench with yeah. a 14th round pick, 13th round pick? Well, you know, it's funny. When I did 999 of those simulations, also the Patriots won all the Super Bowls. In those, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Are, are you a Patriots fan, Joe, or just a, a Brady stan? Uh, both. Well, I was a Pats fan before they won Super Bowl, so I get all the bandwagon nonsense, and then I always inevitably take the Drew Bledsoe jersey out of the closet and show everybody and say, stick it, you know, so I was there ahead of time before the uh, Super Bowls. So I, I don't want to get too far into this, but I, I really have to ask you since you're here, oh, okay? No. So <laughs> everyone today is saying that Patrick Mahomes is now the best quarterback in football. Neither Tags nor I will argue that Brady's the most accomplished there's an argument about whether he's the best, whether he's the most efficient or whatever. He's the most accomplished. But at this point in his career, if you're trying to win a Super Bowl, would you rather have Patrick Mahomes or Tom Brady or somebody else? Uh, see, that the hard thing is like trying to win a Super Bowl. And and if you're just taking to start a team with a quarterback, I'm taking Mahomes still right yeah, now. Yeah, like if you put Mahomes on the on the Patriots, does he have a better chance of winning the Brady on the Patriots? Oh, if you put Mahomes on the Patriots, this is that's an undefeated season, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, he's doing things at that position. You know, we've seen the the gimmicky stuff. We've seen the Brett Favre making the little shovel passes and all that stuff. We've seen some of those things. He's doing it in a different way. He, when you watch him just down in and down out play football, it's and again, this was his first year. Who throws fifty touchdowns in their first season? And and I know some people go, "Oh my God, you know, one year wonder or this." Or that. No, 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 no. He sees the game in a different different way. He's doing things athletically in a different way that nobody else is really capable of doing. And it is it's scary to think of how good this guy can be as he continues to refine some of those other skills, those intangibles, the the film work, the reading defenses, all the other intangible things that Tom Brady is so great at that makes up for the deficits he has in talent level. Yeah. You know, he's like that Derek Jeter. He's like that guy that works above the talent level and just keeps winning no matter what happens. Uh, But I think with with Brady, you know, he is still absolutely still 
part of the the Patriot way and the things that they do. And and he's won different ways. He's won as the quarterback who is kind of the secondary piece. And then he's won as the guy leading the charge. Whereas right now, if you're talking about who's the best quarterback talent wise overall, as great as Breeze is, as Hall of Famers, Aaron Rodgers, all that Aaron Rodgers, all that stuff, Hall of Famer. I'm hard pressed to still not believe that Patrick Mahomes isn't going to throw for 45 touchdowns and 4,800 yards this year. I'm sorry. Wow, Ooh. man. Go ahead. You can boo me all you want, brother. We have two small of a sample size. Guys, Tags, who are you taking? You go, you go and Mitch Trubisky, best quarterback in the NFL right now? It's No, no, absolutely not. These are the same people that told me Todd Gurley <laughs> was going to regress in the second year. And I was like, really? Okay, we'll see that. And Alvin Kamara, yeah. Yeah, I was I was waiting. Are you many, are you many Todd Gurley arguments I had about regression last year? <laughs> so we watched Patrick Mahomes last year, right? We all watched. I watched the games and like he's Brett Favre, man. No, no, he ha- he is a very risky quarterback, and a lot of the stuff that he does is questionable. And there's going to be some things that are going to go the opposite way. And I want to see how he bounces back from adversity. Like I want to see Patrick Mahomes like come off like a three interception game and see how he does because like the things that he was doing didn't work. That's going to happen. It happens to every quarterback. It happened to Brady. It'll happen to Rodgers. It happened to Breeze. All these quarterbacks have to go through that. We just have way too small of a sample size to start declaring Patrick Mahomes the best quarterback in the NFL. That's that's my take on it, is that one year is a small sample size. Like, we've seen Aaron Rodgers go off. You're right. And I'm not one to do that. I, I don't do this lightly. I'm not one of these hashtag guys, like, who just follows whatever the new thing is. That's how astounded I am about Patrick Mahomes. I just want to be clear about that. I am the farthest from, I am the biggest show me again kind of dude there is. But there's sometimes in certain instances when I watch Todd Gurley, when I watch Patrick Mahomes, when I see what kind of situation they're in, the offensive minds that they're uh, that are coaching them, all those things line up into that kind of situation. By the way, last year after he threw uh, three picks, the next game he had four touchdowns and none. So he bounced back pretty good. He's truly ridiculous. I'm not going to sit here and say that he's not uber talented. He's uber talented. He plays with a lot of great skill position players. He has a great head coach when it comes to coaching offenses. So, I mean, th- everything is going in, in his favor. I made the argument that I said if you were to put Patrick Mahomes on the Browns and if you were to put Baker Mayfield on the Chiefs, I think Baker Mayfield's a better quarterback. That's my hot take. That's hot. That's the thing. We're never going to see that. See, now that's funny to me because part of your argument is about how you can deal with adversity. And I understand that Baker Mayfield, there's no quitting him, but there there's certainly some other issues there with Baker Mayfield where you know I think sometimes the emotion gets the better of him. In some ways, and there's sign me up for that kind of quarterback. There's no, oh, yo, me too. Look, I I am excited about the Browns. There's nothing I want more than to watch the Browns start out seven and one and then finish the season one and seven. I want to see them. <laughs> I want to see them get to that point where they are rocking and rolling. They're they're showing up in all these outfits and they're they're doing everything. And the press conference is amazing. <laughs> and then they hit an epic. Unfortunately, the schedule is actually in their favor in the second half, so it's probably not going to happen. But oh my gosh, to watch Rome burn with Odell Beckham and Baker Mayfield and to see everything kind of crumble around and what it's going to happen if those guys eat each other alive, it's going to be great television if that happens. (laughs) I don't know. I just want to be entertained, man. By the way, Aaron Rodgers hasn't thrown three interceptions in 134 consecutive games. Yeah, he also won one road game last year, too, so let's not get too excited about him. Yeah, you're right about that. (laughs) Tex, Tex, who's your number one quarterback in the NFL right now? Not fantasy, just NFL. Yeah, no, it's, it's Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers, okay. I For me, it's Rodgers or Breeze. I mean, Breeze just had the most efficient season of all time. Shattered his own completion percentage rate at 74.4. Uh, he's really good. He just doesn't pass as much anymore, but he's a stud. Yeah, I'll take Brady. I'll take Breeze. I'll take... I think we'll take all of them, right? I think it's safe to say that they're an elite tier and they're all in it. I always put Rodgers... You know, it's funny. As much as Aaron Rodgers is an incredible quarterback... He that's another one to me where I don't know. It's just something about him. It's just something about the way he carries himself and all these things where I think there's there's no surprise that he's only won once. I think there's something else going on there. And it's it seems like. Uh, yeah, it's it's the defense giving up six more points per game in the playoffs than the Patriots. Mike McCarthy is what's going on there. Bill Belichick was going on over there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, that it certainly helps. It certainly <laughs> helps. I'm not going to lie. Brady did say Rodgers would throw for 7,000 yards for the Patriots. We got to We got to go on, though. OK, so, uh, Joe, why don't you give us your second late round flyer that you like? Well, let's stick with the Chiefs because this might as well be the Chiefs show. And it's Nicole Hardman for me because. I know two things. Number one, Mikael Hardman is fast. 
And the second thing I know is Sammy Watkins is already hurt somewhere. He's hurt <laughs> somewhere. Oh, no. And it's, oh, yeah, he is. Yes, he is. Don't say, oh, no, like he's not. You know he is. You know deep down somewhere he's already hurt. I actually think, I, I, I'm going to go on a hot take here. I'm, I'm going to say that I think Sammy Watkins might be like one of the more undervalued players. And it's not to say that I, I feel like you have to attack him in drafts. He might be one of the most undervalued fantasy assets. If you attack him in a draft, he might pull a quad. He might. I just want, I don't want you to attack him at all because he's that fragile. You don't talk about Vance McDonald being fragile. Let's talk about him. But I think that they're going to find ways to get this guy the ball. And it's kind of, it's reminiscent of that first year Tyreek Hill when I kept telling people about Tyreek Hill in the DFS community. I was like, look, he's a tournament play. He's a guy that's really exciting. He's going to have some moments. I don't think you can count on him all the time, but if you pick your spots carefully, I think this is a guy that can make some plays and make things happen. And that's what you want out of some of these late round picks. Can he, can he come in in the flex spot and do something for me? And I think Hardman might be one of those guys this year, again, as the season progresses, but that's somebody I'm stashed on a lot of benches. So he's Curtis Samuel. I know. Hell no, he's not. Oh gosh. I think that's a lot to put on him yet. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm trying to see if that's what you're saying. I think he could be Curtis Samuel last year and that's not bad. Chris Conley was like in that role last year that he that Hardman is trying to earn right now and that's not oh he's so much better than Conley it wasn't a very productive role I mean Bobby's the Chris Conley like cheerleader so I'm not going to argue about that no but... don't put that on me get out of here with that hold on but I also <laughs> want to say that I, I I'm not a big Nicole Hardman fan like I don't think he's like a great football player He's not. He's fast. <laughs> <laughs> Conley's fast too, though. No, I understand. Okay, so why why not Paris Campbell? Paris Campbell's faster. He's got more chances for opportunities. He, I think he's a better football player. There's too many other guys ahead of him on the pecking order. That's my problem. Okay. You know, where I think that th- I think that what they're going to do is, you know, with Andrew Luck, Andrew Luck is like Breeze. He's going to find the open guy. He doesn't care about your fantasy team. He just doesn't care. Well, if he plays... And I, again, I think things are trending in the, you know, oh gosh, boy, you guys are sour. You got to be more optimistic about things, man. Oh, you guys, I think you guys are done. Optimism is how I use Sammy Watkins in a bet and had to do the NFL combine and then set a world record. Yeah. Well, you have to choose your optimism carefully, but I, this kind of goes back to that same deal, which is we're seeing a different version of the NFL where if you can figure out ways to get guys who are incredibly athletic, the football then good things can happen. And I think the way that Kansas City runs that offense, there's lots of opportunity for that. And I think that's part of the thing where you look at it and you go, oh, wow, there's a lot of opportunity you can do that with him. And it a lot of it is because of Patrick Mahomes. And I think that's kind of where I'm getting at. And and look, you know, I understand Tags is, you know, harumphing about it and unhappy about Bumping. it. And I, get, <laughs> I get why. But there's been a lot of guys over the years that have a lot of talent and speed who failed. Some of times it's because they're in the wrong system, and I think he's in the right system to succeed. Sure. I mean, I think there's upside. I'm not going to argue with that. Uh, It's kind of like Marquise Brown. Again, I said Paris Campbell. Um, A lot of these rookies, one one rookie wide receiver is going to finish in the top 30. It happens every season. There's like five or six guys it could be. It's a very deep wide receiver class. I don't think any of them is a lock, but... Wouldn't shock me if it was Debo. Yeah, it could be Debo. I don't know if he's going to play, though, but Hardman's in the conversation. If you're going to take a flyer on somebody, I think he's a worthy flyer for sure. Well, like Debo, the situation is like, who's in front of him, really? You know, like, if is it a matter of just talent winning out? And if so, then maybe he does become that guy who is it for you Mike I'm not a big fan of this wide receiver class like I know last year we had you know DJ Moore and and, um, Ridley like pop off but I I don't really see one in this class that I'm attacking in drafts like I I don't feel it necessary to do it I mean DK Metcalf was like a guy that I was like thinking about because he was tied to Russell Wilson but now that he's had like a scope on his knee um, he's not going to be involved in the week one game plan it might take him some time so I don't think you need to draft him I think he's going to be available on the waiver wire and he he might be a very good waiver wire stash as we see his uh, snaps ramp uh, like ramping up as the year goes on so see to me it's the year of the second year guys yeah it's the years of the Cortland Suttons and the James Washingtons and all all those guys that got their feet wet last year but I think this year can really take a big step forward as opposed to the rookies coming in yeah I'm not a big fan of this rookie class it's not Cortland Sutton's year Joe I'm sorry (laughs) (laughs) well we'll see (laughs) no it's definitely not no 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 that he's on my like do not draft list like if he fell into like the 12th round I don't think I'd take him I, I think you guys okay. have podcast fatigue. I love this. Isn't it? <laughs> no, he's actually losing uh, first team reps to Tim Patrick. Oh, man. That's a real thing. Yikes, buddy. That's not good. Hey, by the way, you know who else is losing first team reps? I don't know if you guys watched the Seahawks last game. This really concerns me, though. I've been hyping up David Moore for a long time. Uh-oh. Drum Brown was playing over David Moore in a lot of instances. That is scary. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes at this point in the season, too, it's about getting looks at guys. 
Like, that's what you want. It's, you know, we've seen a lot of that over the years. And even last year, this is the problem. You know, you're seeing who's getting snaps with the first teams, all this stuff. Sometimes it's a matter of, can this guy operate in the offense? And you give those guys looks because you just want to see. And it's not always a, a rote thing. Like, those, those are the guys that actually make contributions during the year. Sometimes it's a matter of, you know, we didn't see enough in the preseason of him, so let's get him out there more in practices. And I think there's a little bit of an overreaction sometimes to that stuff. Well, you guys thought that Tyler Lockett was going to regress in touchdowns. Uh, Jerron Brown caught five touchdowns last year on 20 targets. Basically, everyone on Russell Wilson's team is going to regress <laughs> in touchdowns because there's no way Russell Wilson threw him for over 8% touchdowns again. Probably not. I'll take a Sutton bet with tags, though. I'll, I'll get on that one. All right, so can we say wide receiver 40 over under? You're going to take – I'll, I'll take the over. You'll take the over? All right, I'll take the under. No. No, you need to pick a player, tags. No, you're not getting away with that. You need to pick a no, player. Why? I'll, I'll get away with that. That's an easy win for me. You could take it. Tags, take Anthony Miller. Anthony Miller face Cortland Sutton. I'll take Miller. All right, I'll take Cortland Sutton. Deal. Done. Sold. Excellent. Minimum, minimum what? 10 games played or something like that? Yeah, minimum 10 games played. That's fair. That's very fair. Deal. Excellent. Good. It's a gentleman's agreement. We have to figure out what the bet is, but we'll, we'll figure that out another time. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll tweet about it. Everyone, it'll be a stir. I'm sure everyone will be waiting <laughs> with bated breath to find out what that is. Can I get in on this bet? Sure. All right. Let me, uh, let me pick somebody here. You're picking a side or you're bringing a third guy? <laughs> <laughs> Bobby gets Golden Tate in his, in his 12 games played. No. <laughs> Hey, hey, will you guys let me have Dante Pettis? No, no, I have Pettis above both of them. Ah, oh, man. All right, well, mm-hmm. I would have taken Anthony Miller in this. I will give you Kevin White, though. Give me, give me Kiki QT. <laughs> He's not even on a team anymore. Give me Kiki QT. <laughs> you love that guy. I'd take Anthony Miller over QT. All right, bring it. I'm in. I'm in on this bet. Three-way. All right, there you go. So all Sutton's got to do is break 40, right? That's, that's what you've got to do? Or you've got to go higher than Miller? What's the deal? Now it's because Bobby made us bet that, but mine was going to be over under on wide receiver 40. All right. We're going to get to tags number two here in just a moment. But first, I want to tell you about one of our new sponsors, Monkey Knife Fight. Do you guys love fantasy sports? Of course you do. Are you ready for the start of fantasy football season? You bet you are. And are you into monkeys with knives who are fighting? You have no idea what I just said to you. That's because you haven't heard of MonkeyKnifeFight.com, the fastest growing daily fantasy sports site on the planet with no salary caps, no sharks. And no advanced degree in math needed for victory. It's daily fantasy prop games, baby. In fact, if you sign up and play now at monkeyknifefight.com, you can get six months of fantasy pros for free. You're going to get a $65 value by just depositing $10. You can do that at Monkey Knife Fight. Just go to monkeyknifefight.com, enter the promo code FANTASYPROS when you deposit to unlock the premium access. And you'll get up to a $500 bonus on your first deposit. I'm not joking. Yeah, football's a week away or so, but if you dig golf... Head to monkeyknifefight.com and you can compete in the FedEx Cup Challenge where you can earn 10 bucks in Monkey Knife Fight credit. Sure, it's not quite the $15 million those tour guys are playing for, but it's something. And guys, a lot of people are already winning at monkeyknifefight.com, and I want you to join them because we are going to help you win, I'm sure of it. Sign up now with promo code FANTASYPROS, Monkey Fight, Monkey Win. Tags, have you given your number two flyer yet? Mine is uh, Mike Davis. Uh, you know, like David Montgomery continues to move up draft boards. Tariq Cohen, we just found out that they want him to have less touches. Maybe there's a reason they brought in Mike Davis. Maybe this is going to be more of a timeshare than people think. But fortunately, if you want to take Davis with your last round pick, Mike Davis is a guy that has multiple handcuff values where if Tariq Cohen, if something happens to him, he walks into that role. If something happens to David Montgomery, he walks into Jordan Howard's role. I have no idea why Mike Davis is being undrafted right now. He belongs in the range with guys like Damian Harris. I, I mean that with all of my heart that Mike Davis is one of the better handcuffs. You don't need to draft him as a handcuff, but if you're one of those people that like, I want high upside guys on my bench, Mike Davis offers that with injury. There is a scenario where David Montgomery gets hurt in the first two or three weeks and Mike Davis finishes the top 20 fantasy running back. Oh, yeah. And everyone's going to be like, Mike Davis, how did this happen looking back? Well, it's possible. Oh, Mike, uh, this is great. I love this. I could not disagree more with this. Montgomery's going to be outstanding. He is going to be outstanding. No, he's going to be great. But I'm saying if he gets hurt, I think Mike Davis is a great backup. Well, that's fine. If, I mean, you can run to the waiver wire. But he's the first. if you draft him, he's the first guy who's going to get dropped. If, as soon as week four rolls around when you got buys and things are happening like that. I'm. You're going to be dropping Miko Hardman. Let's be real. I probably, <laughs> at some point I will, at some point I will, and at some point I'm going to pick him up after a big game. Like I said, he's a matchup play. We're talking about late guys where, right. to me, late guys in 14-team leagues and stuff like that, it's about 
who, who can give me a good week? Who can give me some explosiveness? Again, I, I like to akin to the DFS world of who's the tournament play? Who's the guy with upside that you can plug in there? And I think Harbin might be that guy. And he might get more opportunity when Watkins, when Watkins gets hurt. Not not if. Wait, so you do, do you think that, that guys like Damian Harris should not be drafted then? No, I think Damian Harris should because Sony Michelle is a walking injury waiting to happen. However... <laughs> And that's coming from a Patriots fan. But I think Mike Davis is is sheerly there as insurance right now. And he was insurance for if the kid couldn't figure it out soon enough. And the kid's figuring it out. So I'm not worried about him. You know, if anything does happen, though, and it's a percentage game, like, sure, I'm planning on dropping Mike Davis, Damian Harris, uh, Ryquel Armstead if I draft him, uh, Malcolm Brown. I'm planning on dropping all these guys in weeks three or four when there's somebody better to pick up. But if there's a 5% chance that I'm getting a, a low-end RB1, high-end RB2, I'm taking that rather than just a depth piece that I would end up being dro- I would end up dropping anyway. I'm, I'm taking a chance for these high upside guys who could potentially be a James Conner, an Alvin Kamara, one of these league winners. I don't know if Hardman really has what it takes to be to finish as a wide receiver too, the same way that like a Mike Davis does as, as an RB2. I don't think either of them have that sort of upside. <laughs> so I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll sit on that one for, for those guys. But yeah. I think the problem is too, Tariq Cohen, I think even if he gets a little less of a role, which I don't want to overreact to that comment either. I think what happens is I think the more Tariq Cohen gets used properly, the better he is, and the more efficient he is. And the more you have a guy like Montgomery, being successful in the role that they have him earmarked for, that helps Tariq Cohen a fair amount as well. Oh my God, I'm watching a Mike Tagliere video from last year. We're talking about Jordan Wilkins. Oh, boy, Jordan Wilkins. No, man, we were all talking about Jordan Wilkins, weren't we? Uh, nah, well, I don't, don't want to put we <laughs> into that <Yeah>. conversation. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, guys, so again, I don't want to talk about the same guys over and over. Justice Hill, Dallas Goddard, Devontae Parker that I've talked about quite a bit. Um, but I want to mention somebody, Chase Edmonds, just because he's tied to this high volume offense, and if anything was to happen to David Johnson, and even without an injury to David Johnson, I think Chase Edmonds has some standalone RB4 type of value because they're just going to run so many plays. Like, unless you're planning on David Johnson touching the ball 430 times, I think Chase Edmonds is going to get a lot of touches. So uh, he's going to be used on third downs. Sometimes he's going to get some goal line carries, as we saw last year. And then again, he's got bonkers potential if anything happens to David Johnson. Granted, he's not the same type of athlete. We're anywhere close to David Johnson. What we've seen in the past, when these guys get hurt, Le'Veon Bell gets hurt. Um, D'Angelo Williams is a top five fantasy running back. Spencer Ware gets hurt. Kareem Hunt takes over. James Conner takes over for Le'Veon Bell last year. He's an absolute stud. Happens over and over and over again. It comes down to the scheme and the offense, and they're going to run so many plays that I think Chase Edmonds would be an RB1 if David Johnson was to get hurt. I don't disagree with it chase edmonds was in an article i I put out today if you guys haven't checked it out it's who to target with your last draft pick i have chase edmonds in there i agree with you on this one bobby i think that if if they want to run the 70 plays they're talking about he could have an austin eckler type role in that offense where it's like david johnson could uh, david johnson can still touch the ball 20 to 25 times and edmonds can see the eckler role of like that would still leave eight nine ten touches for yeah eight to twelve touches per week and that's going to present like rb4 rb5 but like with handcuff value so i'm on board with this one now, Joe might disagree, but he's probably going to fight anyway because he's in the mood to fight since we picked on Hardman. I'm in the mood to fight. You guys are sour, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I, I'm in agreement. See, we can all come together here on this one. But not on Mike Davis. <laughs> just not on Mike Davis. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just not going there. I'm sorry. You know, and maybe it's because I own every share there is of David Montgomery and I just refuse to look at it that way. <laughs> but I know what my eye see and I and I, to me, you know, if you're aggressive on a guy like Montgomery, it's for a reason in the draft. And I think the reason is we're going to play him. And, and Mike Davis is the perfect kind of guy to bring in as an insurance policy. But I'm with you on Edmonds. I actually think this is a guy that can be useful, especially in the deeper leagues. And uh, look, you know, it's not like David Johnson doesn't have a history of of missing time, you know. So we want to talk about running backs who miss time. As great as David Johnson can be, he can also be a guy that just it disappears for long chunks of seasons or entire seasons. So I think it's a very savvy little pick there. All right. So we're going to do something a little different this round. We're going to each name three more players since we won't get to as many as we as we wanted to. Um, just break down one of them, though. Give us three names, Joe, and then break down one of them. All right, uh, I will give you three. The first one for me that I'm going to give you is Devin Singletary, but I think that's also talked about way too much. Uh, The second one for me that I'm going to give you uh, is, you're all going to laugh at me and I don't care, it's Tyler Eifert. Tight end sucks and all he does is catch touchdowns. If he's on the field, he catches touchdowns. But the guy I want to break down is Alexander Matson over in Minnesota. And it's because, again, kind of like the other thing of 
Dalvin Cook is great talent. I love Dalvin Cook. Nobody had more Dalvin Cook shares than me in his rookie year. I was a little less shares last year. This year so far, I have none just because it just hasn't worked out that way. But I will tell you this. You have to look at the insurance policy. And I think Matson has proven so far he can be a three down back. I think Matson also, they look at it as, hey, even if Dalvin Cook has a good year, He's in the last year of his contract next year. That might be a perfect opportunity for them to move on and sell him high and move on from him, especially the way running backs want to get paid nowadays. So for me, I think Matson not only in redraft this year is worth a look in 14 team leagues, but I also think he's very much uh, worth a serious look in any sort of keeper dynasty format. I don't have any problem with that at all. I mean, I'd love to say Mike Boone's going to steal the job, but it's more likely that Mike Boone gets cut. I would love for him to get cut and go to Tampa Bay or Dallas or something like that. Take over. I love anybody to go to Tampa Bay. Just somebody, <laughs> please save us. Yeah. Somebody save us in Tampa. But yeah, I think Madison is the clear backup there. And if anything happens to the fragile Delvin Cook, that's a great call, man. I'm not going to argue. Tags, who do you have for your three? My three, uh, it's really tough to like to figure that out because it's like you're trying to stay late in the draft where everybody has an opportunity. I, I think like some names I definitely want to mention, uh, Jack Doyle and Jordan Reed at tight end. Uh even Jimmy Graham, like those are the three guys like where it's like if you're waiting at the tight end position, those are the three guys that I would definitely look to. Um, and then the last one I'll mention is that I think is worth just like a, a again, this is the last pick that I'm talking about is uh, Richard Higgins. You know, like running backs, you know, we've, we've talked about a lot of running backs in the show already and saying that, you know, they don't have value until there's an injury in front of them. That's fine. Like a guy like Chase Edmonds, you're not going to want to put in your starting lineup unless something happens to David Johnson and unless you're like in a, in a really bad, you know, bye week situation. That's fine. But we're looking for a potential like, you know, we hit fantasy gold, right? Like, let's pretend that something happens to Odell Beckham or something happens to Jarvis Landry. All of a sudden, Rashard Higgins is number two wide receiver for Baker Mayfield in that offense. And Odell Beckham, you know, or Landry, they receive the attention. Whereas Higgins last year, he only see. So once Baker Mayfield took over as a starter, he targeted him 40 times. On those 40 targets, 30 receptions, 455 yards, that's over 10 yards per target, and four touchdowns. Like, that he's already surpassed Antonio Callaway on the depth chart. He's 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 shown time and time and again he's able to play in the NFL. It's just a matter of like, do we have the guys that believe in him? It seems like Baker Mayfield does, and this coaching staff is finally willing to put Antonio Callaway in his place and say Rashard Higgins is a starter. So I, I think with the final pick, it's like if you want to drop him after week one, that's fine. Uh, but this we're looking for lightning in a bottle here. Yeah. All right, I've got three more names here. Uh, Sanu, if anything happens to Julio Jones, I mean, Sanu was a top 30 fantasy wide receiver last season with Calvin Ridley and Julio Jones. He always produces. It's not sexy to draft him. If you need a wide receiver five who can produce in a pinch, great. And I think he's got plenty of upside too. The same way I think of, you know, Justice Hill. He's going to be useful. And if anything happens to Mark Ingram, he's going to be great. Same with Latavius Murray. Uh, another one is Justin Jackson. I think he's the true number two behind Melvin Gordon. If Gordon holds out, I think Jackson leads this team in carries. Eckler kind of stays in his role, picks up a few extra carries as well. And the last one I want to talk about is Jalen Samuels. He's going right now in the 12th round. And it's the same kind of thing. I think he has standalone value because of how they're going to use him, not just out of the backfield. They're splitting him out wide. I mean, keep in mind, this guy had tight end eligibility last year for a reason. He used to also play tight end. He can catch the ball. I think he's going to end up with a lot of targets. And if anything does happen to uh, James Conner, who, keep in mind, last year was fatigued later in the season. They kind of shut him down. Jalen Samuels could be a monster in this backfield. So he's one of my favorite backups as well. What do you think of him, Joe? Uh, Again, this is another one of those backup situation to handcuff things. And yeah, you're right, because we all know that with Pittsburgh, Whoever steps into that role is probably going to be at least mildly productive. We've learned that over the years with D'Angelo Williams. We learned it with Connor and Samuel seems like he could be another one of those guys. So, yeah. And and you know what? I'm one of these people that I don't love to handcuff running backs necessarily in a deeper league, though. That's the one that I always have hesitation on. And actually, you know, I always feel like whoever the secondary guy in Pittsburgh is always worth a look. And last year in Scott Fishbowl, I drafted Connor as a secondary guy in case Le'Veon Bell didn't play. And that worked out pretty damn well for me. So I think Samuel's that same kind of guy. You take the one off on him in the deeper leagues. And if something goes awry for James Connor, you know, Samuel's becomes a very, very valuable fantasy asset because of the offense. All right, guys, we'll keep it going here in just a moment. But first, I wanted to tell you about the best place to play best ball that Tags and I are always talking about. Fantasy football fans, listen up. If you want to join the biggest NFL season-long tournament ever, you're going to love Draft. They've got their $3.5 million, $3.5 million best ball championship on draft. It is freaking huge. And here's how best ball works. It's season long, but with no management. You just set it and forget it. Once you're done drafting, that's it. No trades, no waiver wire. You don't even have to set your lineup. Your best players get automatically started and you'll get your best score every week guaranteed. There's no salary caps. You play in a real live snake draft, just like the ones you're playing with your friends in a season long league. 
There's no better place to play, and you can draft a team anytime you want. Leagues start every couple minutes, so you can join one right now. Just do a draft, and you can be a millionaire 16 weeks later. It doesn't get any easier than that. Join me and Tags on Draft today. Download the app anytime. Just search Draft in the app or Play Store and join a game in minutes. Or play right from your computer on Draft.com, whatever you want. For a limited time only, you can get a free entry into the Best Ball Championship when you make your first deposit. But you have to use my promo code. It's FANTASYPROS, all one word. That's right, a free shot at a million dollars just by using my promo code FANTASYPROS, all one word, when you make your first deposit on Draft. Just search Draft in the app or Play Store or go to Draft.com and come play free with promo code FANTASYPROS. You know, before we move on to kickers and defense special teams, I actually wanted to ask you guys about a few players that are getting a lot of hype here lately. And just, you know, if you guys think that they should be drafted in the late rounds, or if you think the idea is just kind of bogus. Okay, so the first couple, Jacoby Myers, Preston Williams, guys like that. Uh, In Dynasty League, sure. Yeah, in Dynasty, but I'm talking redraft. People are drafting them in the 14th, 15th round because they're hearing all this hype out of camp. Mm, I think it's, it's, I think it's, this is more of a situation where it's like they need an injury to get there. And, um, you know, Jacoby Myers is playing a lot in the preseason. Like he's doing well. And that's the thing is like, he might be the eventual replacement for someone like Julian Edelman, but uh, without an injury in front of him, like, I I don't know. It's tough to say because like they have Maurice Harris. So, I mean, there's a lot of names there. Demarius Thomas is like now like coming back from the Achilles. Like apparently Achilles is like, okay to come back if you're 32 years old. Yeah. What in the world? So it, I'm not really into those guys. Like Preston Williams is someone that I definitely like in dynasty. And is it possible that he makes a wave? Uh, yeah, because there's nobody on that depth chart that like really scares you. Like Kenny Stills is a guy they haven't extended. He, I think his contract's up at the end of this year. Albert Wilson is going to play the slot. Devontae Parker has been a disappointment. Um, but you know, if he struggles out of the gate, do they give Preston Williams more opportunity? I, I could see it happening. So that's someone I guess, but you're tying yourself to a really bad offense, which is why that I like Rashard Higgins more than those guys. Cause it's like, at least you're tying yourself to Baker Mayfield in that offense. Yeah, I agree with tax uh, Higgins, that kind of pick that makes sense to me. But the other ones, I think that's a waiver. That's one of the guys you put on your watch list right away. Yeah, you could take you could take Ted Ginn instead of those guys. I know a lot of people don't like to draft a backup quarterback. But what if you draft someone safe and then you draft an upside guy like a Josh Allen, who's going around uh, round 14? A lot of people are taking him. Well, I'll tell you what, if you're going to draft Drew Brees, I think you should draft a secondary quarterback because you look at those splits last year. They were brutal. 217 on the road, uh, eight touchdowns or nine touchdowns or whatever it was on the road last year compared to 22 or whatever it was at home. It, it's just he's not the same guy. And I'm and I'm all for getting those big games out of Breeze. But if you had a Lamar Jackson, if you had a Josh Allen as your secondary quarterback with Breeze, I think you're maximizing that spot and it's worth it because this, this, the, the road home splits are so drastic. Um, I think if you're drafting Andrew Luck this year and you take a shot on him because you're getting a value. I do think it's smart to go draft another quarterback, or whether it be a Winston or a Cousins or somebody like that, just in case he's not healthy because you can and because you want to back yourself up. It's worth it because now you're getting a discount on luck in the 6th, 7th, 8th round sometimes, depending on how far he, dro- he drops, that it makes sense that you might as well back him up with another decent quarterback for free because the upside is Andrew Luck's healthy and he's great and he's the number one or two quarterback overall, and he can just jettison that other quarterback or use him as trade bait. So I think that's the circumstance for me. I think if you're going Andrew Luck, you back him up with Dak Prescott, who's got three great matchups to start the season, and then Luck should be back by that time. I got Andrew Luck in the 10th round the other day. I was like, not there was no chance I was going to draft him, but he dropped to the 10th. Sure, man, I'll do that. Yeah, it's crazy. I I still think Luck starts the season. I think he's going to be out there week one. Okay, and the last one I wanted to ask you about, he's moving up a lot of rankings, is Adam Humphreys. He was used so much at the end of last year by Tampa. Yes. Looks like he's going into uh, a nice role with Tennessee. They passed to him a ton in the first preseason game, but Corey Davis wasn't there. So what do you, what do, you do you buy it? Yeah, I do buy it. I'd buy it because Corey Davis, there was no reason for him not to get double teamed last year. And I know he saw a ton of targets, and I know he wasn't very efficient with them. But I think bringing in guys like Adam Humphreys, not only does it help whether it be Mariota or Tannehill, wherever it is, but it helps Corey Davis also. I think this was a very positive move. He had a very underrated second half last year. I feel like nobody was talking about him. And yeah, granted, he's playing with a better quarterback last year than he is this year. And I understand Tennessee is not a very exciting offense, but that doesn't mean that a guy in that role like Humphreys with his skill set can't be productive in a deeper league because I think he can. And that's another guy, another one of my guys on my list that in those deeper leagues that on my bench you're going to see Adam Humphreys because I do think you can throw him in there and I think he has a decent opportunity for a good floor every week last nine games of the season he was wide receiver 16 guys ahead of Stefan Diggs but now he plays with Marcus Mariota ahead of Kenny Galladay Kenny Galladay without Marvin Jones and Golden Tate by the way or maybe we should save tags now Marcus Mariota gets to play with Adam Humphreys <laughs> maybe the glass is half full and not half empty screw Corey Davis Adam Humphreys 
you know what it is? I know what it is. You spent a whole show with Seeley last week, and now you've picked up on all of his negativity, and that's what it is. I'm going to go speak <laughs> with him after this is over. <laughs> okay, guys, we do need to move on and talk about DST. So um, we've already mentioned it in the, in the show before. Some people are taking the Chicago Bears in the eighth round, the Jags, or the Chargers, or the Rams in the 11th, 12th, 13th. Joe, was there any situation whatsoever where you would take even the best DST before the last round? No. Nope, not doing it. No, I just I refuse to do it because, you know, we know the adage that, you know, the best defense doesn't always repeat. But, you know, you get some of the guys in the top five over and over again in terms of those. And I actually happen to have a fair amount of IDP leagues, too. So I don't have this problem necessarily. But what defenses are in the top five over and over again? Because I'm looking at the DST one the previous year and the next year they finished number 20, 14, 12, 5, 14, 16. No, but I think there's collectively units like the Jaguars year over year that people will value the same last couple of years. They're in that top five discussion. Sure, but they were they were DST 16 last year. Well, in terms of finish? Yeah, I'm not saying they're going to finish it. I'm saying in terms of preseason ranking them. Okay, yeah, yeah, sure. They're kind of in that same conversation. And yes, I think part of the reason why they fell to 16 was the complete ineptitude of the offense, which I don't know if it's going to be complete ineptitude, but I think ineptitude is still going to be a word you use to talk about them. As a Jags fan, yes. As, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just part of the deal. Um, I think the Eagles are, are a nice unit that I think can can be very good. I think they're going to have a, a, a lot of good matchups within that division uh, sometimes as well. I know people don't want to hear it, but I think the Patriots are a much better defense than people realize, too. They finished top 12 last year. Uh, I don't know how this whole Patrick Chung thing with the cocaine just, you know, dropped out of nowhere out of the sky today. So we'll see how that affects. I don't like losing him. I even think a a unit like the Buffalo Bills, they're a very physical unit. The secondary is very good. Uh, Edmonds is is a terrific player. And I think that even if it's a streaming defense in week one, I think the Bills have a little bit of love in my world, too, where I think you can kind of pick them up and and roll with them because I think they're going to surprise some people. I really do. Yeah, they've got a couple good matchups to start the season at the Jets, at the Giants, face Cincinnati. All three of those are good text to you. And now you got Ed Oliver in the front, too. Let me mm-hmm. tell you, you can get some push there. Their problem was getting to the quarterback last year. Secondary is very good. Problem was getting to the quarterback. You get a big boy like Oliver up front, too. I think that changes a lot of how teams are going to have to, you know, the offensive line is going to have to address them. But I think Buffalo is going to be one of those sneaky ones this year. Tags, I don't like any DSTs just because even the number one DST, you can pick up the top streamer every week and they will outperform the number one DST over the course of the full season. Not the Bears last year. Yeah, well, not the Bears last year. I'm saying if you draft the number one DST, yeah. Right. No, I know. I know what you mean. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Everyone's so sensitive now. That's what happens, you guys. <laughs> So essentially, I mean, you're not going to be owning any DST for the entire season. You're going to end up streaming at some point. It's just mathematically the best way to go. But um, there are a couple DSTs that I like in the first three weeks. Do you have a couple that you're fond of? I like the Browns, man. Like the Browns defense is like there's so much talent on this team. Like the linebacker is like the weakest part for sure. But like when you look at the front, like Ogunjabi, uh, Sheldon Richardson, Olivia Vernon, Miles Garrett, like that's ridiculous front four. And then like they added Greedy Williams alongside a Denzel Ward on the back end. They have Demarius Randall and Morgan Burnett. Like they're one of the more talented defense. And it, it reminds me of the bears last year. You know, I told people to draft the bears. Like they had a young defense uh, that was coming up. There's just too much talent on this defense for you to pass them up and going up against Tennessee in week one is never a bad thing, especially knowing that they're going to be without uh, Taylor Lewan, their starting left tackle. So the Browns are, are a team that I'm willing to take a shot on for week one. Um, and like the Ravens, they're actually falling outside of like the top 10 in drafts most of the time. Well, they lost their whole defense in the offseason. I've got them as a defense to avoid. I don't want any part they of play them. the Dolphins in week one, dude. OK, sure. That, that's fine. I mean, if, if the Chiefs were going up against the Dolphins in week one, I'd play the Chiefs. Yeah, for sure. Definitely would. <laughs> like Frank Clark would have a field day. But for long term, I don't like the Ravens quite as much. Now, you mentioned the Browns. They're one of my favorites. Uh, another one that I like is the New England Patriots. They're starting the season against Big Ben. And, uh, you know, Big Ben, he passed for a lot of yards and touchdowns last year, but he does throw a ton of interceptions. I think he's the the favorite in Vegas to lead the league in interceptions. Week two, they get the Dolphins. Week three, they get the Jets. Week four, they get Buffalo. Week five, they get Washington. <laughs> week six, they get the Giants. Week seven, they get the Jets. And they don't have a bye till week 10. Yeah, and that's what I keep telling everybody. Look, you could draft the Pats. I mean, the, every single year the Patriots get this cupcake schedule. Yeah, and uh, that's what we've got again. So, and Bobby, I'll tell you what. You you look at them; they don't have a bye to week ten, which means that you want to talk. You don't have to take them out of your lineup. You can draft the Pats offense and just leave them there for the first nine weeks and just go, okay. Yeah, I'm taking them out of my lineup against Baker Mayfield probably in week eight, but you you don't have to. I don't know if you want to do that, man, because they get up for those games and Belichick gets up for those games. I mean, you know, they they have those moments there. I mean. 
you saw Deshaun Watson the first time he went into New England, he looked like a deer in the headlights. And Watson's an, a terrific talent. The defense I have the most exposure to, or at least I will, because they're available in every league, and I don't draft a defense special team. You can look that up. It's my uh, my cheat code series. Uh, don't draft a kicker, and also how to maximize DST value. And I'm just not drafting a DST, and I'm going to pick up the Cowboys last minute. So I'm going to draft Malcolm Brown in their place, and if nothing happens to Todd Gurley, Great. I drop him and I still pick up the same defense I would have drafted the Dallas Cowboys who get Eli Manning and the Giants. And then they get Washington in week two, Miami in week three. So that's where I'm going with DST. Yep. I was actually going to say that they're uh, they're definitely one of the better picks if you want to wait on defense too. All right, guys, let's round it out with kicker. Is, is there a strategy with kicker? Or do you just want to tie your, yourself to high? Yes. Reach for Greg Zerloin. I am not kidding. Re- what? I am not dealing with it. Hold on. Reach how far? Like two picks <laughs> no if you want to do like the 14th round i'm good with it i mean that's not gonna happen he's got an adp in the 11th round tags does he really okay i'm not reaching that far yeah dude i'm not reaching that far a kicker you know what what mike's saying is your condition and i am too which is in any of the you know analyst expert draft whatever the hell you want to call them we're also disciplined nobody's gonna do that but yeah what bobby's saying is right it does his adp is not speaking to that <laughs> that's crazy like that's there's always someone in the league and they all the funny thing about these people and i'm sorry if, if it's you guys who are listening to to the episode like no i'm not sorry they need to be talking this is an intervention they need yeah i mean i guess so but like they get so <laughs> excited they think that they've got some cheat code where they're drafting this defense this kicker in the eighth ninth round or whatever and they're like bragging about their team and everyone else in the league is like dude you screwed up so bad and then they draft a second Second kicker in round 15, just in case. Ugh. No Ugh. kickers. No, don't even play with kickers anymore. I, I, I agree. I don't have none. It's just it's just a waste. No, it's it's not great. In reality, I want to get one of Zerline, uh, Justin Tucker, Harrison Butker, uh, Stephen Goskowski, uh, Kaimi Fairbairn. Like outside of those guys, maybe Will Lutz, but outside of those guys, I don't want to deal with it. I, I legitimately do not want to deal with kickers at all. So like I was in an industry auction uh, this past weekend and uh, I ended up taking, so someone nominated Zerline for a buck and I'm like, I'll go two. And nobody wanted to go three bucks for him. So I'm like, yes, that's fair. That is the only fair overpick. They all made fun of you after the draft tags. Every one of them. I was, I was so no. happy to have it over and done with like l- legitimately. I was just so happy because like I'm in the, pro- how early did it happen? Mike? It, it happened at the start of the auction. It was like, and he may have been like the 10th player. Oh, and the oh, well, sure. Then nobody wanted to do that. No, exactly. <laughs> I was willing to do it because I didn't want to deal with it. So Bobby, I'm in a pros versus Joe's thing. And, uh, that fantasy mojo puts on. And so I, this is like a 28 round draft. I drafted three kickers. Two of them don't have jobs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I am not dealing with the kicker BS. Like I'm taking one of those guys that's not getting cut. Oh, no, screw kicker, man. And the funny thing is, like Matt Bryant's been one of the best kickers in the NFL. He doesn't even have a job. He's also pretty old. I mean, sure, he's pretty old, but he's still really good. You can be 80 years old and be a good kicker. Adam Vinatieri is still doing it. He, you know, here's the criteria for me: when it comes to you and whatever kickers on the board, look for the kicker in the best offense, and preferably one that you know has a decent track record. Uh, preferably one with the later round, you know, the later buy that you can find maybe too. So you just don't have to worry about it and switch that quickly. And you just don't overthink it. There's, there's like a couple little criteria. And and I will say, that's what I look for. I say, okay, how late is the buy? How good's the offense? How much do I trust this guy to keep his job that I know he's a, a proven guy and that's it. And then you worry about it as it goes. And I think that you stick to that when it comes to your last round, you have your kicker and then just don't worry about I it. I guess Giorgio Tavecchio is someone that I probably should mention. Like the, of course, he's Italian. <laughs> yeah. The, no, the Falcons play like, I think it's their first like tw- 11 of their first 12 games or something like that in a dome. So it's like having a kicker in a dome is always a good thing, too. And then the other ones are all in good weather. Well, yeah, it's still weather. It's outside. Yeah, but it's in the West Coast. Some of that's what it comes down to. <laughs> you want to pick guys not just tied to good offenses. You want to pick in good matchups. And, um, you know, there are teams who consistently give up quite a few extra opportunities to kickers for whatever reason. Um, the Dolphins are one of them, the Bengals are another, the Giants. And so I like to target those, but always avoid playing games outside in windy weather just because it can be the difference between the team saying, you know, we've got a 45-yard field goal attempt, but we're just going to go for it because the odds of him missing the, the field goal uh, go up quite a bit more. So, Tags, you mentioned all the guys that I was going to, except for one other, Matt Prater, just because he kicks a lot of deeper field goals and there are, those are worth more points. So, again, I'm not drafting a kicker. What I'm going to do is just pick up D- Dallas and Diaz T and kicker they're going up against the Giants it's a good matchup and uh, it's going to be at home I think that it's going to be fine and then week two I'll just play the streaming game again 
Bobby's talking himself into it. I mean, I, I'm not opposed to it for sure. Like, I'm really not. Like, if you don't want to draft a kicker or a defense, opposed to what? Waiting until past the twelfth round uh, to take Greg Zerline. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like, kickers like give me nightmares. I I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at that Falcon schedule again. That's please just. Next year, get kickers out of your league. And I do want to mention one additional piece with DST. And this is in my article if you want to go more in depth into the math. But talking about advanced DST streaming. So I'm not drafting any defenses. But in week four, when the buys start, I don't mind using my last roster spot for a second defense. That way I'm not having... Because you can always pick up the great waiver wire pickups. You can spend five, six fab bucks and get the best DST. And usually those guys are ranked in the top three every week, even though they're not owned. And so you can pick those guys up in advance and save yourself over the course of the year 80 fab bucks if you're getting the number one DST. And the top streamer overall would end up being the number one or number two DST every single season. So you can guarantee yourself the number one or number two DST by just using an additional roster spot at the very end of your bench. Yeah, so if you want to, like, so if, you, if you're, like, someone that's, like, worried about streaming and you don't know how to do it or if it's your first time, like, being like, oh, I usually draft a defense. Wait, okay, stream defenses this year. Listen to the ones that we talked about, and I do an article every single week. It's, like, it's early weekend stashes where I basically look forward to the, the following week, and I tell you to grab those defenses off the waiver wire before... You save, you save Fab so that you can pick up the next Nick Chubb whenever... They're free. They're th- Exactly. You're going to get them for free on the waiver wire because I look at defenses that are under 40% owned um, and then you're able to grab them and what's going to happen is everybody's going to go to the waiver wire on Monday you know for the you know Tuesday or Wednesday wa- waivers that clear and they're going to be like oh where's the oh they're on Mike's roster and it's like because like I'm always looking forward a week if I'm streaming exactly yep nailed it man it's good advice all right guys that's all for today's show Joe we really appreciate you coming on and uh, making kickers and defense special teams entertaining <laughs> <laughs> well I appreciate you having me on as always I love spending time with the two of you even when we fight it's still fun so and in fact <laughs> sometimes it's more fun when we fight so I, I love it and I appreciate you guys always having me on it's always a, it's always a good time and I enjoy I enjoy it because I think it I think people benefit from that too I think people benefit from the conversation and then our job is to give everybody our opinions our informed opinions and then you go out there and and you make a decision and, you know, decide why Joe is right. <laughs> <laughs> we love you too, Joe. Thanks again for coming on. Always, dude. All right, guys. And I want to say thanks to the sponsors of today's show, NFL Game Pass, where you can get a seven-day free trial to NFL Game Pass at NFL.com slash Fantasy Pros. And Draft, the best place to play best ball. Get your free shot at a million dollars by using my promo code Fantasy Pros, all one word, by searching Draft in the app or Play Store or go to Draft.com. And Monkey Knife Fight, where you can get up to a $500 bonus, and you'll get our six-month premium subscription if you just deposit $10 at Monkey Knife Fight. Again, that's monkeyknifefight.com, promo code FANTASYPROS. Monkey Fight, Monkey Win. For Joe Pisapia and Mike Tagliere, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening, and enjoy your football.